Hello and welcome to Runkle the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Today I want to talk about Jordan Peterson. And you probably already know who Jordan Peterson is. He used to practice as a clinical psychologist and he still maintains that designation. But now what he does is he writes books, he does podcasts, he does YouTube stuff. He's basically an influencer. And he has a wide variety of controversial views on a number of hot button topics, including transgender issues, uh, racism, overpopulation, and so forth. Now, I'm not going to dig into the correctness of his views here, because ultimately, I'm not going to convince anybody on that, and that's not what this video is about. This video is about the legal issues, and I want to talk about those. Um, I also am not going to be digging in and reading the case in full. Um, I started recording it, and I stopped recording it at about an hour in. I'm going to probably do a live stream where we go through the case and talk about it. Uh, that'll take a while. But for right now, I just wanted to give a shorter video with a, an overview. So what happens? Uh, Dr. Peterson is commenting online in a variety of formats, including Twitter. Um, he appears on the Joe Rogan show and so forth. And a number of the things he says upset people. He makes people angry. And a bunch of those people file complaints with the Ontario or the College of Psychologists of Ontario. And some of these are formal complaints and some of these are just people tweeting at the college. I don't know if they should be accepting complaints by tweet, but apparently they, they did. So as a result of this, they open an inquiry. And the ultimate decision of this inquiry is that they're going to, they order Dr. Peterson to participate in what they call a specified continuing education or remedial program or a SCRP. Uh, the decision calls it a SCRP through most of it. Now, Dr. Peterson is not happy with this and we can talk a little bit about why, but he takes this and he challenges this in court. He's entitled to review this um, under the standards of judicial review. And he did so, and the decision just came out. He lost that decision. Now, he can appeal that higher, but for right now, he has lost that decision. And ultimately, this is one that might end up at the Supreme Court. We can talk a little bit about that. So, why is he not happy with this? Well, um, some of the concerns he might have, and I'm just sort of trying to read his mind here, I guess, a little bit, are right here. Um, so they say that he's got to participate in a coaching program directed by the college to reflect on and ameliorate his professionalism in public statements. Uh, he was advised that failure to complete the program at his own expense and to the coach's satisfaction may result in an allegation of professional misconduct and the commencement of disciplinary proceedings by the college. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, the college gave him two names. They gave him two different, um, you know, people to choose from. They said, those are the two people. You have to pick one of them. So he doesn't get to choose sort of his own people. There's no, like, pool. It's not like there's hundreds of these people and he can just go to any of them. Whereas, by contrast, like, if I was directed to go and get psychological counseling or something you could just go to any psychologist um, not like one of two different people so that's a, a reason for some concern it's also at his expense and his expense might be significant um, i don't know who they're sending him to but it's probably that they're sending him to another psychologist and psychologists cost a lot of money it would not be unexpected to hear that they charge something like three to five hundred dollars an hour and if this coaching program ends up being like 80 hours of of time well then you know you're talking about something like up to forty thousand dollars assuming my you know my mental math is correct that in turn puts a a financial penalty on this they've said that there's no disciplinary aspect here he's not being punished he's just being sent for more training but if somebody asked me to spend like to pay 
$40,000 or even $5,000 based on some things I said online, I would certainly feel punished. Um, so yeah, the other thing is that there's no objective standard for successfully completing this program. It's to the coach's satisfaction where they are satisfied that he's not going to do it again. Well, I'm just going to say, who is going to sign off that Dr. Peterson is never going to piss somebody off online again? I certainly wouldn't. Um, like there's just no way I would sign off on that no matter what he does, because how would you ever guarantee that? How would you ever say, oh yeah, I've, I've ensured that he will not make more comments. Um, I just don't see that as even feasible. So he might have some concerns about being required to pay, you know, potentially tens of thousands of dollars in order to go through this program. And at the end of it, there's no guarantee that even if he's trying his best, even if he's doing whatever, um, it might ultimately be that there's just no way to pass the course. So that's concerning. And I know lots of people out there really dislike Jordan Peterson, really hate him, in fact. And you may be one of them, dear viewer. And I just want you to consider, this is the important thing whenever we're considering rights issues. I want you to consider, would you agree with this process if it was being applied to someone you do agree with? Some firebrand who's on your side um, or yourself, you personally, would you feel okay with this process if it was being applied to you personally. All right, now let's have a look at the statements he made because I feel like we need that in context. So, or we need that little bit of context. So we've got, um, between January and June, 2022, the college received numerous reports about Dr. Peterson's conduct on social media and in his public appearances. The reports again raised concerns about Dr. Peterson's professionalism, including whether his tweets complied with the college's standards of professional conduct. The tweets and statements included the following. So A, a tweet on January 2nd, 2022, in which Dr. Peterson responded to an individual who expressed concern about overpopulation by stating, you're free to leave at any point. Now, for important context, this was taken as a, um, as a, as a comment about self-deletion and you can see I'm already having to censor myself for YouTube here, but, um, now that's kind of inappropriate from a psychologist, but it's not really that far. And I'm going to say like internet discussions are not always polite. People are not always polite in responses. And the number of times I've had somebody on Twitter or Reddit or something uh, respond to some equivalent of KYS, um, over a comment, including lawyers, um, thing, that kind of thing is a lot. Um, you know, every time you disagree with somebody on something trivial, there's going to be somebody out there who takes it way far and, you know, responds with that kind of comment. Um, you're free to leave at any point is a very understated way of saying it compared to some of the things I've received. It's not like he sent the guy a death threat. And it's also not like he was using his um, professional status there. Like he didn't start a made application for this guy or anything like that. Okay, carrying on. Various comments Dr. Peterson made on a January 25th, 2022 appearance on the podcast, The Joe Rogan Experience. Dr. Peterson is identified as a clinical psychologist and spoke about a vindictive client uh, whose complaint about him was a pack of lies. Speaking, so let's look at that because there's two comments that they take here. Um, this client uh, made a complaint to the regulatory board about Dr. Peterson, which was found to be unfounded. It was not a justified complaint. Um, if somebody complained to your boss to try to get you fired, and ultimately was found to not be justified, would you not use similar language? The other thing I'll note here is that there's no allegation that anybody would be able to identify this client. There's no allegation of a breach of confidentiality or anything like that. So 
Um, speaking about air pollution and child deaths, Dr. Peterson said, it's just poor children and the world has too many people on it anyways. Now, I'm just going to say, I think that this is a real a-hole comment. I think Dr. Peterson's being a real prick right at that moment. But again, that's not normally sort of a cause to lose your designation. But they carry on. There's more things he said. Um, a tweet on February 7th, 2022, in which Dr. Peterson referred to Gerald Butts, who is a Canadian political figure, as a prick. P-R-I-K. Um, I assume that that was a spelling mistake. And quite frankly, the biggest thing I see that they might have concern with this is the spelling mistake. Because quite, f you know, uh, Lenny Bruce basically said the reason why it's important, and I'm paraphrasing here, to uh, to be able to say um, to say fuck is so that you can say fuck the government. The most fundamental building block of political commentary and discourse is to say that politician there is an a-hole and screw that guy. Uh, everything else that you might say is really a is building on that basic concept. You know, you might explain why that person's an a-hole and why you dislike them, and you might provide additional justification and, you know, explanation and reasons and so forth. But fundamentally, the concept is, screw that guy. Um, so, this is normally something we would consider the height of protected speech, to call or like to call out a politician. Okay, um, so a tweet on February 19th, 2022, in which Dr. Peterson commented that Catherine McKinney, an Ottawa city councillor, so again, another politician who uses they, them pronouns, was an appalling, self-righteous, moralizing thing. So that is pretty, you know, that's pretty hostile. But again, it's commenting on a political figure, and while it's reprehensible as a way to refer to somebody... It's, at the end of the day, like, what's the harm here? Um, and some people might say, oh, is that hate speech? It's nowhere near hate speech in Canadian law. We'll talk a little bit about hate speech in Canadian law as we go. Uh, they also say, um, in response to a tweet about actor Elliot Page being proud to introduce a trans character on a TV show, Dr. Peterson tweeted on June 22nd, 2022, Remember when pride was a sin and Ellen Page just had her breast removed by a criminal physician? Um, again, you can say this is obnoxious and, you know, whether or not you'll say that depends on your political views and so forth, but it's not hate speech. It's just an unpopular political view. And here's the real thing. We'll get to, you know, we'll get to their arguments in a moment here, but uh, carrying on. Uh, a further complaint about Dr. Peterson's January 2nd, 2022 tweet in which Dr. Peterson responded to an individual who expressed concern about overpopulation by stating you're free to leave at any point. So again, that same issue. The further complaint provided a link to a 2018 GQ interview in which Dr. Peterson made a similar comment about suicide. Um, I'm seeing a little bit of kind of hypocrisy here because he said there's too many people in one comment and there's... You know, he's also mocking people who are concerned about overpopulation in the other. I don't know, but I don't follow Jordan Peterson well enough to, uh, so, yeah. Um, Peterson's tweet posted in May uh, 2022, in which he commented on a Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition cover with a plus-size model, tweeting, Sorry, not beautiful, and no amount of authoritarian tolerance is going to change that. So, let's... um. Let's talk a little bit more here about, um, you know, about what he's um, expressing here. Because his views here, and this is what's got a lot of people upset, is his views are anti-trans, his views are anti-fat acceptance, his views are various things. And so lots of people want him to be removed as a psychologist because he holds those views. But in their decision, they specifically state that he has a right to hold those views. 
and they specifically state that he has a right to express those views. He has the right, they say, to communicate these views, and they say that this decision does not limit him from doing so. However, they say they don't like the way he communicated those views. Well, some of these comments, I'm just like, how else do you phrase them? Um, you know, the sorry, not beautiful, and no amount of authoritarian tolerance is going to change that. They find that this comment is inappropriate. But not, they say, because of the underlying idea behind it, but because of how he expresses it. How else do you express it? How, you know... I kind of feel that this decision is being dishonest. And what I mean by that is I think that they actually are going after the views rather than the expression. And again, you might really dislike Jordan Peterson's views, but consider if it was your views. Um, you know, I talk a lot about firearms. What if this was about pro-firearm statements or anti-firearm statements? Um, the... Doc, you know, uh, Doctors for Gun Control or whichever organization that is, they say some really, um, really extreme things sometimes. I've had people tell me that they hope I get shot. I've had people tell me all sorts of things. And I don't think they should lose their license for it. I think they're jerks. But I, I still think that, you know, like, why would they lose their license? unless that starts treading into how they actually behave as a doctor. Now, the uh, they say that they properly considered the charter in this decision, but one thing I think they failed to consider is the impact of their decision in terms of the public um, views, because lots of people can look at this and say, listen, we think Jordan Peterson is a jerk, but the behavior of the review board, the behavior of the college is something that is also going to be concerning. Uh, if people don't think that the college is respectful of all sorts of views, that can be an issue in and of itself, um, especially where some of these issues start to connect to protected grounds like religion or culture or so forth. Um, so they're saying, you know, you can't, uh, I just have some concerns. Now, all of these groups are regulated bodies. The, you know, the College of Psychologists um, regulates psychologists. There are further groups that regulate things like psychiatrists, doctors, and lawyers. And one of the things they point out is they point out that, that um, it's been previously established that some of these uh, rules can regulate your behavior outside of your actual professional activity. And I just want to point this out because they reference a couple of cases that are um, legal cases. And so right here, they reference the case of Quinn and the Law Society of Can uh, per Canada, and also Adams and the Law Society of Alberta. Both of these were lawyers who were uh, sanctioned for their behavior, not as lawyers, like not in the course of their legal activities, but for their activities personally. But let's consider what activities personally we're talking about here. Because in the case of Quinn, uh, we were talking about somebody who, you know, was a lawyer, but had sex with minors. And in the case of Adams, we're talking about somebody who was a lawyer, but had sex with minors. And I feel like that's a very different category here. Um, I feel like that's a very different element because we're talking about things that are actually criminal. Whereas the criminal law in Canada, there are criminal laws that say that you cannot engage in hate speech, but the charter would expressly say that you have the right to say things that are short of hate speech. And hate speech has to be a really high level. It has to be, and I'm going to really, um, really overly paraphrase it here, but it has to be to a point um, where it might actually increase the risk of violence to people um, in a, you know, in a meaningful way. Uh, so the comments that get found to be hate speech are pretty horrible things, 
Whereas if you want to say like, I dislike particular group or I think particular group is, you know, is bad. Um, that's all fine. It's, and it's, it's tough here. You know, if you want to say that a particular religious text is false, that's protected speech, even though it might really upset people. So, yeah. Um, I just, I just kind of go like, this is concerning. Um, and let's talk a little bit about the standard review because standard review is done by a case called Vavilov. And Vavilov applies to any decision by these sort of administrative decision makers who are not courts. And what Vavilov says is that you have to apply um, a standard of reasonableness to these and that that involves a fairly high degree of deference to the underlying decision. You assume that they are correct. You assume that they are experts in their field, which includes applying the law to their field. Now, I look at this and I go, you know who's actually an expert in applying the law? Judges. That's who's an expert. And this is not a standard we apply to legal cases. If I, you know, if, if you're charged with a crime and later convicted and you, you appeal it, and one of your arguments on appeal is just that they got the law wrong, that their interpretation of the law, pure law, was wrong, then the standard on review is not like reasonableness. Was that a, a, a reasonable interpretation of the law? It's correctness. Were you, were you right? And if you are not right, then the court feels the need to correct it because of course the court's place is to apply the law and to make sure that the law is followed and to um, keep those standards up and running. So I have a concern that we're creating this sort of field of things that, um, you know, um, where you have judicial review, but that the judicial review can't actually fix a legal error unless it's a really bad legal error. That is really concerning to me. Um, I just, um, I don't know that I see the reason for that much deference. And this decision is doing exactly what it was intended to do, which is really limiting the number of time, the availability and the amount of successful judicial reviews. And so it makes it less, people are less inclined to bring these judicial reviews and more, um, you're probably much more likely to be stuck with the decisions of the ad administrative bodies. But they're not judges. Um, if I want to, if I'm going to be judged, I want to be judged by a judge because that's what judges do, right? Um, so I am concerned by this. The other thing is that you'll see a lot of commentary saying, listen, uh, these decisions were, um, you know, were reasoned, they were transparent, um, they were justified. Um, justified is a term that probably means something different than what you think it means. When we think justified, we tend to think of correct. But here, a justified decision means something that is justified as in um, they provided a justification for it. And even if the court disagrees, at least to a certain extent with that justification, it's still one was provided. Um, and, you know, when it's intelligible and so forth, we say, okay, this is, um, you know, that it's understandable. They didn't have uh, their rationales, uh, weren't, weren't crazy. That's sort of their consideration on all of that. So I, um, I think this case has um, potential to go further. Jordan Peterson has a fair chunk of money. I think that he's got a, um, the willingness to appeal this uh, a lot further. But the question is, do I think this current Supreme Court is really going to stand up for protecting, um, uh, you know, rights in that uh, way? Do I think that they're going to be wholesome defenders of charter rights? Um, I don't really. Um, 
So I uh, I have some concerns. I think that this is a bad test case because Jordan Peterson is such a polarizing figure. And this case directly applies to me. It directly applies to me in the sense that um, I am also in a regulated profession. And am I going to get dragged in front of them for a discussion on social media because I called Jordan Peterson a prick as an example? And I mean, that was a very intentional example. It was very much, you know, I knew what language was coming. I knew what was what comes next. And I, I picked my words in order to, uh, to reinforce that. But this decision says you don't need to pry into the motives that Jordan Peterson had for saying any of these things. You don't need to look at that. So maybe they won't. I don't know. Maybe I've gotten myself into a lot of trouble with this one, but um, I am going to do a full breakdown of this case at some point. We'll go through it sort of in full detail, but I didn't, I wanted this one to be a little more digestible. And unfortunately it's still like half an hour. So sorry. Um, Anyway, thank you guys for watching. If you watch to the end, um, I hope this hasn't ticked people off too much. As I said, I'm really trying to uh, keep my feelings on Mr. Peterson um, as not the main, you know, main event here. And hopefully I haven't sort of tipped my hand too heavily because the goal is not to, um, is to, it's not about him. It's about the principles here. It's about the legal issues and, um, that always concerns me. So thank you for watching. I hope you found this to be interesting or educational. I hope I haven't um, made too many people upset or angry, but I also want to thank my Patreon supporters at the $50 level, CCFR, came Canada's National Firearms Association, and the Canadian Shooting Sports Association. At the $30 level, Sights and Arms Limited, and uh, at the $20 level, uh, this is Lindsay Metcalf, Larry Kalniak, Here's a Coin Legal Witcher, Cameron Johnson, Andrew Elsich, uh, Vicky, and Dorky Dane. Thank you as well to my $10 supporters who will be in the crawl immediately following. Thank you for watching. I hope this has armed you with knowledge. See you next time.